Well, thank you all for joining us. We're so excited and honored to have with us Nancy Atwell, um, who, among many other uh, things, won the Global Teacher Prize last year. Um, in the latest series of our Teach for All Talks, we orchestrate Teach for All Talks, which are discussions with education leaders and social change advocates and thought leaders um, just as a way to provoke and advance the thinking of the staff and um, of both our global organization and, and our partner organizations. So we're going to have just an interactive, fun discussion. Um, I hope everyone will tweet in your questions. I'm at Wendy Kapp, and we're using the TFAL Talks hashtag. And you can also um, email mitchell.craft at teachforall.org. So please do keep your questions coming. Um, and I'll just say by one other small point of introduction that actually we haven't had this discussion, but as one of the judges for the Global Teacher Prize, I poured over all of these materials and I was just particularly inspired by your incredible work. So I'm so excited to be able to bring that to life for our community. Thank you. So just to get us started, can you just share a bit about how you got into teaching in, in the first place? Yes, I, I certainly never intended um, to be a teacher. I um, particularly didn't like teachers and um, enjoyed a very rich social life, uh, especially in my secondary school experience. Um, but the um, tests that I took, the New York State Regents tests at the end of my senior year, um, qualified me for a free ride scholarship to any state university. And although nobody in my family had gone to college, um, my uh, father was a mailman and my mother was a waitress, um, my mom, who was a true uh, depression baby, said, well, this is free. So why don't you try this and see if you like it? And so I applied to the State University College at Buffalo, which is a big commuter school. They virtually take all comers, and so it was a no-brainer to get in. And the combination, again, of my scores on the Regents test and my parents' low income made it a, essentially a free ride. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I loved it. I loved it. It was absolutely nothing like high school. Uh, I had all this autonomy all of a sudden. I mean, I never read a single one of the books that was assigned to me in my four years of high school. I fudged it, wow. bluffed my way through, listened to the discussions. Uh, I remember once a friend of mine filched a ditto master for the test on the Great Gatsby out of the uh, wastebasket in the teacher's room. So we all looked up the answers before the test. Um, <laughs> but I always read. And I, I had rheumatic fever as a kid and was bedridden for about six months and became a reader during that time. So I um, ended up as an English major in college because I found that I could go to the college bookstore and I could see what books the different professors had ordered for their classes and then I could pursue my interests as a reader based on the course descriptions and those, and those books they'd put aside. Um, and so I eventually became an English major. And after four years with a BA in English and no idea what to do with it, I um, decided I'd stick around and do a spend of student teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this was in um, Buffalo, where I grew up. So I was uh, at a couple of uh, middle schools and high schools in the area. And the first time I took over a class, I think it was at the Tonawanda Middle School, um, I just knew I was home. I, I, um, it, was, it was instant. And um, the idea that you could spend your whole life, this could be a career, talking to young people about books mm -hmm. and, and poems and authors and plays, um, it, it struck me as, as a dream job. And I've been teaching English for 43 years. It still strikes me as a dream job, um, and more and more so as I was able to define it for myself. So I, I, um, I literally fell into teaching. But as soon as I did, I understood that it was, um, it was the most remarkable. And also the emotional rewards. 
I just love this. Hmm. Now, you have been a real pioneer in developing further uh, the reading and, and writing workshop approach to teaching and, uh, and to literacy development. And I wonder if you can share a little bit more about this approach and why you're passionate about it, um, and maybe starting with the reading workshop. You know, Wendy, I'm going to start with writing because that, was, that was my evolution. Okay. Um, in, in the early 1980s, Donald Graves, who, who is my mentor, um, he passed away five or six years ago, and it's been a, a real loss for the educational community. He was a professor of English education at the University of New Hampshire. And he started doing research at the National Institutes of, under the auspices of the National Institutes for Education, looking at young children's writing development. And um, Lucy Calkins was one of his assistants on that project. Um, they worked in an elementary school in New Hampshire and um, observed children while they wrote and discovered that, um, that children were perfectly capable of developing their own topics for writing working at their own paces, uh, having conferences with the teacher and with peers about their work in, in process, writing for many audiences, writing in many genres. Um, it, was, it was a revelation, this research. I was so resistant to it, I can't begin to tell you, because my whole experience had been um, assigning writing. I had worked uh, using James Moffat's hierarchy of kinds of genres, and had designed a year-long curriculum. It was even published as an article in an English Journal. So I thought my curriculum was brilliant, this assignment a week, assignment a week, assignment a week. And it, it took me a while to let go and just see what was possible for my own students who were not first and third mm. graders. They were seventh and eighth graders. And so I remember it was, a, it was a day in March in 1980, and I'd just been so agitated about the tension between these two methods that I closed my classroom door and I was teaching six periods a day, three periods of writing, three periods of reading, and I asked each writing class, there's this school in New Hampshire where children are doing these things as writers. Would you like to do them? And every class said, well, yes. That sounds like authentic writing. Um, and so we began there. Um, and I pushed that model up to the, the secondary level. And my kids began to become real writers for the first time. Not people who were um, fulfilling an exercise, but yeah. real writers writing for authentic reasons, authentic purposes. And my teaching now was one-to-one -one because I was helping them act on their intentions. Mm -hmm. And I was very successful teaching writing that way for a couple of years until um, Thomas Newkirk, also on the faculty at the University of New Hampshire, helped me take a hard look at what I was doing when I taught reading. Because reading was about as traditional as it could get. I had a Scott Forsman anthology. Um, the kids read <laughs> excerpts and they answered questions, or I introduced vocabulary and we gave quizzes. And one day a week, the kids had um, something called SSR, sustained silent reading, which was big in the 80s. And, um, and they were always begging for more time to read. And I was always saying, we have reading every day. We have, you know, what, what, what? So Newkirk comes up to visit. And, um, and he's a brilliant guy, but also very frank. And at the end of the day, he saw me teach writing three periods and reading three periods. He said, you know, you, you kind of have a writing ghetto here. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you've got this period where the kids come in your room and they act as you know, intentional uh, uh, users of language for real purposes. And then they come back in for reading, and now reading is something you do to them, as opposed to the writing which they do. Mm. And that was um, the impetus to start to dismantle my reading curriculum and start to invite kids to be real readers five days a week. Mm. Um, and that was the beginning, I think, of, of reading workshop anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it was fun then to say, how do I stretch them and challenge them while they're choosing their own books? You know, they're reading 40 books a year on average. How do I make sure that those are, those are healthy choices, good choices? Um, how do I make sure that there's a kind of ladder? Mm -hmm. So they may enter the ladder you know, at um, oh, the Twilight series. I'm thinking of a, a student um, named Heidi, who came into my school recently as a seventh grader and started with the Twilight books. She was thrilled to encounter them. Um, 
and she'd never chosen her own books before or read independently in school. So um, I let her read those books. I mean, just the challenge for her of managing a big, fat book was, was good for her. But at the end of the school year, her favorite books were um, uh, The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver and A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. So you, you saw, I saw, that um, it wasn't random, this selection of books. You know, it, it was purposeful, and it was also me introducing books and nudging Heidi so she could make that transition. She said the last week of school, you know, I went back and I tried to reread one of those Twilight books, and I couldn't do it. She said, she's a, she's a bad writer. Mm. <laughs> I said, well, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and you taught yourself to, to know that. And, and can you say more about your trajectory as a teacher? Like, you ended up writing, did I read this correctly, nine books? No. I know a big bestseller in the middle, but, and multiple other books, too. I think maybe 13. I, keep, I lose track. 13. Yeah. So how did all this happen? And then you started a center, but you've somehow managed to remain really deeply connected to the classroom. And can you share a bit about how you progressed? Well, um, once I had the writing and the reading workshop going, there were books being published by Don Graves and Lucy Calkins about young children and what was happening with them in writing and reading workshop, but nothing about kids at the secondary level. And I started you know, speaking at conferences, and I published articles in the English Journal. And, um, and there was a lot of interest, and a lot of interest in the, the nitty-gritty details of it. Um, so I knew that there was, there was an audience for a book about what was possible for older kids. but. Um, I also was so excited about what my kids were doing as writers and readers. I'd just never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was, it was the sort of sensible, satisfying program I wished I'd had you know, when I was a kid. And then I wanted it for other people's students, too. So um, uh, I wrote a chapter and went to one of the um, National Council of Teachers of English Convention. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew Bob Boynton because I just started doing some graduate work at the Breadloaf School of English, and he was closely associated with it, and cornered him and gave him the first chapter. Um, teachers weren't writing books at that time. I said, I, I think I have a book. Hmm. And uh, was that Bob Sweet at the convention? He was, a, was the, the good old days of the good old boys publishing. Mm -hmm. So like he, lots of scotch. You know? <laughs> and he went, went in the bedroom with the chapter, and I sat out there drinking my scotch. And then he came out, and he said, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd like to publish a book. Wow. Um, and uh, that was In the Middle, the first edition of In the Middle. Hmm. Which became a huge bestseller and has had multiple editions. I mean, the thing that I was so struck by, among many other things, which we'll get to, actually, but about you know, just, just reading about your, your journey and all this is just the extent to which you did remain deeply centered in the classroom experience, but also were able to exert such incredible leadership in helping to kind of shape the teaching profession. And I have a feeling that you're a person of kind of rare energy and vision for spreading impact, but I, I wonder if you have thoughts on what we could do to, to support other teachers to exert that kind of leadership. Because it, it seems like that's one of the things that's most missing in education is just not, not that, I mean, there's tremendous amounts of teacher leadership, but we need still more, you know, of teachers actually shaping the future of the system. And I, I wonder if you have thoughts on how to enable that. I can't say enough for the power of writing, the power of teachers telling their stories. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a way to define and articulate what you're doing and why, you know, what matters, what lasts, um, what your theories are, what your beliefs are. Um, what you've observed kids doing and what sense you've made of it. Um, I, I stayed in the classroom until two years ago because um, without students, I don't have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Th that's my evidence, and that's, um, that's, that's the source of my, of my curiosity and my passion, is, is watching what happens with them and then trying to pull, pull lessons from what I see going on. Um, there are three editions of In the Middle because you know, I keep teaching. And I keep seeing new things, and I keep changing my mind. So Heinemann has to put this little bubble up in the corner of each edition. 70% new material, you know, 83% new material. 
because um, although my basic principles have stayed the same, I keep pushing, um, pushing into experiments with methods that will um, make it even more rich, interesting, mm -hmm. authentic, long-lasting um, for my kids. Mm -hmm. I, I think teachers need to write. I'm, I'm so excited right now because um, the, the National Council of Teachers of English uh, publishes a journal called Voices from the Middle. And um, it was started by two middle school teachers, Maureen Barbieri and Linda Reef, and then it was taken over by university types. And the last couple of iterations have not been great in terms of the um, editors. And now it's turned back to a couple of classroom teachers. So for example, I would suggest if you're an English teacher at the middle school level, there's a place to tell your stories mm -hmm. and, and start to make an influence. Um, if you're a teacher at the high school level, English Journal is the place. Mm -hmm. and, and also to propose sessions to the National Council of Teachers of English conventions, because that's, that's really where I began to develop my public voice. You, you, have, to, you have to be out there professionally. Um, and, and again, writing articles and speeches and then finally a book um, you know, gives me that presence that lets me be a teacher leader, but at the same time, my material only comes because I'm in the classroom. I'll never write another book. Um, great. I'll, I work with all the kids, the older kids at my school, grades three through eight, as a writing support teacher. So basically, I go in and have conferences with kids all day long. It's the best. You know, I don't take anything home. I don't bring anything there. I, you know, and after 40 years of having writing conferences with kids, I have, I have a lot of um, expertise. So it's just putting all that mm -hmm. experience to good use makes me mm -hmm. so happy. It's like, it's the best teaching gig you can imagine. It's like eating dessert all day, having mm -hmm. these conversations with kids. Mm -hmm. But they're somebody else's students. Yeah. You know, they're, not my, they're not my stories to tell, you know, what's going on with those kids. I love that message to teachers. We're going to try to, to spread that. Um, how, um, I mean, one of the things I was also really struck by is you, you teach in Maine. Yes. And yet, from reading everything about your classroom, it feels like your kids are some of the most kind of aware of the world, you know, kind of compassionate, empathetic, you know, possessing a kind of cross-cultural understanding. And I'm wondering what led you to be focused on that and kind of how you have accomplished that? Um, well, it's because I teach in Maine. I, mean, the, I was shocked when I moved there from New York uh, in 1975 at how little exposure the kids had to anything. Mm -hmm. I remember um, we took uh, a bunch of kids out kayaking on the Damariscotta River, and uh, a woman who had a house on the river had a bunch of kids from the Fresh Air Fund staying with her. One of my students actually said, look, there's, there's one of them Roots fellas. I said, whoa, mm -hmm. we just have so much work to do here. Um, mm -hmm. And I um, asked if I could and did teach history mm -hmm. and civics and current events as well as writing and reading. And I've been working ever since to um, make my kids' worlds bigger. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were never middle school kids involved in the Model UN program in Maine before, but I um, talked my kids into it so that they were you know, with a bunch of high school kids, but they were learning about other countries in the world and the problems of the world. Um, rather than not celebrating any ethnic or religious holidays, we started to celebrate all of them. And for each teacher to take on a handful and teach about them and organize activities around them, so for example, um, so far this year, we've celebrated uh, Rosh Hashanah with you know, honey and apples, and we've celebrated Yom Kippur. We'll celebrate the Day of the Dead. We'll celebrate the Chinese New Year, and always with food, activity, and discussions about those events. So um, I've really pushed to help open the kids' eyes to the people they're going to meet out there when they go to school. And of course, we're just pushing all of them. Mm -hmm. At, when is the operational word that you will go to college, you will, you will encounter the world, and you'll recognize it. And then another thing that I've worked really hard at is to get books into the classroom libraries that reflect the experiences of kids in all kinds of settings. Because there's nothing like the knowledge kids get from vicarious experiences. You know, the people they learn about, um, the problems they learn about, and the empathy that, they are, that they're able to experience um, because they're living inside of characters and books. 
So yeah, I, I think, um, you know, in particular, it's a, this gorgeous place to live <coughs> with um, a very conservative and to some extent kind of empty mm -hmm. culture. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to, to fill it with the impact of the, of the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want them, I want them to be good citizens yeah. when they grow up. That's the short answer. I'm only checking my phone because I'm checking for your questions. So feel free to, to email them in. I have several more, but, but feel free. And you all in the room can ask questions as well. Um, you have been um, kind of outspoken about the limitations of the current kind of accountability push and the Common Core Standards efforts in the US. And, um, I wonder if you can say more about your concerns. I got home from Dubai after the, this incredible surprise and honor of winning the Global Teacher Prize, went right on CNN the next day and put my foot right in. <laughs> uh, you know, the host said, you know, what advice would you give to young people considering teaching? And I said, you know, look for an independent school because if you're creative and smart, you're going to have a hard time in this current climate. Mm. Um, we know there's a teacher shortage. And all I can think is, if I were an English major now, the way I loved discussions, writing, um, uh, authentic experiences for kids as writers and readers, there, there's, there's nothing in the current core curriculum that I would see meeting the real needs of kids to become um, effective, habitual writers and readers. For example, I think the gateway genre is poetry. We don't teach it in April at my school. We start with it K to eight in the spring, I'm sorry, in the fall, because, well, a ton of reasons. First, because it's the language of feelings, so it gives kids an experience right away of understanding that, that writing is good for something. The poet, poems are so brief that kids can write three or four in the first six weeks or so of school, and they can experience a complete writing process, you know, drafting and revising and editing. And, and have finished products and learn quickly from each one of those experiences. Um, and all the lessons that I teach about effective poetry transfer to effective writing across the curriculum. So we just build on those lessons about theme and diction um, and specifics all through the rest of the school year. Well, poetry has been dismissed K to 12 um, from the English curriculum by the Common Core. And at the high school level, there's no more narrative writing. Now, the most important piece of writing a kid is going to write who's in high school is that college essay, which is essentially a, a personal uh, essay or, or, or a memoir. And they're, they're getting no practice in that. But instead, it's endless practice in the five-paragraph essay. I can't believe we've devolved you know, back to my situation of the 1960s as an English student, where that's all they're writing. You know, it's, it's just shocking to me. I also have you know, serious concerns about close reading, this idea that kids have to look at a piece of writing cold and only stay within, I hate, I always do this, the four corners of the text um, and only parse in relation to what's on the page. Um, David Coleman was the architect of the language arts standards, and he went to Yale. And Yale is one of the first, I'm sorry, one of the last uh, colleges in America that still subscribes to the new criticism. And that's the new criticism, where you don't consider context at all. You just look at the text. So we have this, and then the whole thing about no fiction, that, that nonfiction is suddenly privileged over, over stories and a, and a real um, snobbery about stories, as if even good nonfiction isn't a story. I mean, basically, what's not a story except, what, an actuarial table? You know, every, everything's a story. So um, I, I, what I see happened is that a bunch of people with their own little hobby horses and biases got in a room, and Edie Hirsch said, well, let's have, you know, nonfiction and we'll learn things. And David Coleman said, well, let's have um, the new criticism like I had when I was at Yale. And somebody else said something else, and they cobbled together a curriculum based on no research. You know, for, for, a, for, a, for a set of documents that uses the word evidence a hundred gazillion times, there's no evidence behind this curriculum. Plus, it was never field tested. Mm. 
So it was just shoved down people's throats. It's, it doesn't represent anything that I know about literacy scholarship. Um, is that too subtle for you? <laughs> I wish we could have a whole big discussion about everything you just said. But let, let me ask just one. I mean, I guess I'm wondering, I mean, so much of the motivation, I think, behind the standards movement, like being clear about what our standards are, being sure that the standards, and I understand you're sort of arguing about the nature of the standards, but are based on high expectations for kids. I mean, I think. So much of the motivation was around ensuring equity for kids. It's like, yes, we need excellence and we need equity. And the fact is we've got all these kids in the system, low-income kids, kids of color, who are battling so many challenges, including the low expectations of the system. And um, I think that's just it's kind of the origin of the accountability movement, the standards movement and such. So I, I guess I wonder how you think about that. Like, how do we... You know, if we don't embrace standards and accountability and such, like how do we attain a much more equitable system than we've historically had? Do you have? I, I don't um, uh, disagree that there should be standards. I think these are the wrong standards. Um, you know, I would say, for example, that um, you know, every we want every seventh grader to choose books across a range of genres and get a lot of practice reading. Yeah. Um, and I would say we want every seventh grader to uh, develop topics and ideas for writing and experience a range of genres and you know, produce effective writing across that range of genres. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very much an old school English teacher mm -hmm. in terms of um, what, I, what I want kids writing to look like and what I try to nudge them toward reading. Um, it's not, um, it's not soft or mm -hmm. indulgent. Mm -hmm. But what I see happening is that, for example, in, in, in independent schools, nobody has adopted the Common Core because they have their own really rich curriculum. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see is that kind of rich curricula in the public schools instead of this you know, very stripped down, I think, almost um, intellectually bankrupt. It's, mm -hmm. it's just not engaging for kids. Um, method. I would fill the classrooms of uh, schools in low-income districts mm -hmm. with books and give kids time to choose books and read them. Yeah. It's not that I don't think um, that those kids deserve a shot. It's that I think what we're asking them to do isn't engaging them. And what we're seeing already from the test scores that are resulting from these reforms is that they're not having an impact. Mm. You know, um, kids in low-income schools, kids, um, uh, minority kids, need the same sense, satisfaction, and ability to engage that kids in, you know, you know, rich suburbs need. They they need that kind of experience. Um, and I, you know, I'd also argue for the kind of wraparound services. I, I was lucky enough to have um, dinner with Jeffrey Canada last night. Um, where, where a whole community gets behind those kids. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's the kind of thing that makes a difference. Not just saying to those kids, you know, work harder, you know, do this stuff, raise yourself up by your bootstraps. Mm -hmm. um, and not saying to teachers, you know, be really rigid and boring mm -hmm. to get them ready for more really rigid and boring teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's, the, there's this really interesting tension, I think, in this country. We see kids can either do two things in school. We say, we, well, they can, um, they can resist or they can comply. And I think what the Common Core people are mostly saying is, we had all these kids who were resisting, and now they're complying. Mm -hmm. you know, they're doing these curricula, and they're taking these tests. Nobody thinks about the next thing mm -hmm. which might happen, and that's engagement. You know, that's not the only alternative <clears throat> to resistance. Every child deserves to engage everybody's achievement is driven by interest. Mm, yeah. It's so interesting because I, I do think that the impetus behind the Common Core was to say, let's, in fact, raise the level. Let's, let's stop teaching towards low-level, rote, you know, standards and, and standardized tests and, in fact, aim at, you know, fewer, higher standards that in, require critical thinking. 
I think it's, it, it's clearly so much about how it's done. I mean, I've got kids in public schools in New York, and literally the seventh grade curriculum is what you just described. It's like, read 40 books, choose from a range of genres, you know, lots and lots of writing, um, and they all claim it's all Common Core aligned, and whatever. So I, I guess it's just all in how it's, I, I just wonder if we get, it get, comes back in part to the question of how are we developing teachers to, to actually meet these higher standards? I don't know. Well, I, I know so many teachers who've left the profession. I mean, extraordinary English teachers and elementary school teachers, mm -hmm. because they were in school systems where they were required to, you know, open the box from Pearson yeah. and teach this, you know, common core curriculum. Yeah. It's, it's interpreted different places. I think that. Um, I just wonder if it's an implementation. Choosy teachers, issue. yeah, I think choosy teachers can, you know, yeah. interview and um, inquire about what their possibilities are for being autonomous. Mm -hmm. It's where their teachers have no autonomy yeah. that um, the Common Core is really hurting kids, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, let's switch gears. Two last questions, um, from me at least, and I'll check my email as well. But um, there's so much discussion about the sustainability of the teaching profession uh, for, for a very good reason. And you have you know, seemingly as vital and, and engaged as ever for 43 years, you said. Um, and I'm curious what, what you would say has been the key to that, and, and also what we can do to ensure that the teaching profession becomes more sustainable. Well, again, I've, um, I've had autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, almost exclusively, I've either closed my door um, and experimented and then opened my door and said to the principal, like at the Booth Bay Region Elementary School, this is what's going on, come on in and look. Mm -hmm. Or I've just um, uh, created situations where I could be autonomous. It's, it's been um, a phenomenal career because I've been able to be so creative and also so responsive to kids. And that's what makes it sustainable. I mean, I, I also have to say I taught you know, 12 and 13 year olds. So I always knew every day I was gonna have a good laugh. You know, they're, they're, they're so unpredictable. You just never know. And they can be so witty. So I enjoyed the age group a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but I also knew I could be a learner in my own classroom. And I think that's what makes teaching sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so if you had, you know, a couple of thoughts about what we need to do to change the teaching profession to make it more sustainable for folks. I think to um, create opportunities for more autonomy. Yeah. To say this is a creative profession, you know, uh, to say to teachers, um, we're going to reclaim um, uh, teaching as a profession and not as um, what as a as a technical um, you know para profession, but you know we want people who are reflective practitioners and we're going to give them room um, to do extraordinary things with kids. It's not. It's not that the Common Core standards, and I'm going to come again. I, I'm just so upset right now about um, what it's done to English, what they've done to English teaching in, in many schools. Um, it's not that they they're so rigorous that they've um, uh, you know put pressure on teachers that teachers don't like. It's that I think teachers who read research, there's a body of literacy scholarship, know that the standards are in fact ridiculous, and. So they, um, you know, I think teachers need room to respond to the best of the literacy research. I mean, we have, we have two decades of research right now that says, here's where literacy blooms. When kids have access to great books, the ability to choose their own, and time to read them. You know, there's there, um, experimental and quasi-experimental studies, again and again and again, showing this is how we get kids to be great readers. I, I always think of, um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, where he talks about the 10,000 hours of committed practice that anybody needs to become an expert at something. Mm -hmm. The kids at my school get that kind of practice as readers. You know, they are critical, skillful, avid readers mm -hmm. um, because they're choosing their books and then they're talking with their teachers about their choices. Mm -hmm. um, now, last night, I understand that you gave a big speech to a big influential audience, and I'm, I'm, tell us more about that and what your message for them was. Well, it's, it's a similar message. It's about book reading. 
you know, I, for a, a range of reasons, I think that education policymakers uh, either dismiss or bypass um, the results of the research that I just described. I mean, it doesn't make money for anybody. No commercial interests are going to get rich by, you know, children reading one book at a time, the teachers buy one book at a time. Um, it doesn't play into a lot of people's ideologies um, because, you know, again, if you think kids should be close reading six books a year, that's all, and everybody reading the same book, and it should be on the list of the canon, um, then it doesn't play into that. Um, and um, I said we need global classroom libraries. You know, we have more kids in school globally than we ever have before. Attendance is way up, which was one of the UN's uh, core millennium goals. But achievement isn't. So it's not just getting kids to school. It's what happens when they get there. It's methods that matter. And so I propose, um, modestly, that every, <laughs> every classroom in the world have a classroom library you know, filled with books, um, and that kids have chances to um, to read stories and exercise all those reading muscles that are essential um, for being global citizens and critical thinkers um, and people who um, you know, can contribute something to the world because of the experiences they've had only in the pages of books. Mm -hmm. And I also said we need paper books. Oh, I was just going at it. No. <laughs> awesome. Um, um, that the Tyndalls and the e-readers um, that m my kids have experimented with um, you know, they get them for Hanukkah or Christmas and they bring them in and they last for about a week and then I never see them again and they're back to the books from the classroom library. And when I talk to them, they say, you know, um, you have a sense of geography when you're reading a real book. Mm -hmm. Like you can sort of thumb on the right and you say, okay, this author has like 20 pages to resolve this plot. <laughs> you, know? Where's, you know, where's this going? Or I need to flip back because I'm, I'm unclear about what happened there because I think this is, you know, this is a flashback. Um, so they don't have that, um, the, the physical facility. But also, all the research right now is showing that kids don't remember as much when they read it from a screen. And also that um, if my kids all have to read every night for half an hour. They read in school, and then everybody's homework, K to 8, is to read or be read to for half an hour. So they go to bed with a screen, and it, it interferes with the production of melatonin, which is the sleep hormone and then they can't get to sleep for two hours because of the blue screen. So there's all kinds of things that I think are questionable about the e-readers, but here's the big one. The kids who came into my classroom carrying the Kindles were among a group of kids who had book jackets. And the book jackets are like a badge when you come into a reading classroom. This is what I'm reading, you know, and everybody else says, oh, what do you think? And, I've read it, and you know, you're going to love the sequel. And there's this camaraderie that develops. It's not a book club, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's a, a, a community of book readers. And kids who are carrying around a gray screen um, are, are, are part of that, of that community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a small thing, but it ended up being a huge thing for my students. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask just a couple of audience questions, and then we can close it out. So from Becca Ships, who's back here in the audience. Um, how do you define success for your kids, and how has that changed over time? Um, I think that uh, when I started teaching writing and reading workshop, I had, um, I had like three expectations for reading and three expectations for writing, that kids would do these things by the end of the school year. And now using the smallest font type, I can barely fit the expectations for a year of writing and a year of reading onto one page. Um, the more I've learned, about what good writers and readers do, the higher my expectations. Um, the more I've seen what kids can do on word processors and computers as writers, you know, the, the, the more my expectations have changed in terms of the nature of what they do um, when they're composing on a keyboard versus composing by hand. So at the beginning, I just said, for example, as, as writers, write whatever you'd like. But then I realized I couldn't give pointed lessons because they weren't working on, a, on the same genre together. So now I expect that every kid across the school year will produce at least three to five free verse poems, um, a memoir, a couple of reviews. We have a book blog that our school publishes on the, on the internet, um, essays, uh, profiles, advocacy journalism, parody. So they're, they're producing a body of work across the genres. Um, 
another example would be that I expect the kids are going to be producing at least three to five pages of draft every week. That um, quality grows from quantity. They just have to get those muscles working as writers. So, I mean, my book in the middle is pretty much like a set of blueprints for how I define success. But again, I have, I have high standards. I've really ramped it up um, over the years. That's been the big change. But it's been in response to my own research um, and reading other people's research and reading about other teachers' methods and saying, you know, this is an even richer version of literacy. So it's time to make this change. Um, and from Anna Pena, who's also here, um, what can those of us who aren't teachers and aren't working in school systems do to support teachers to become leaders? You know, that's, that's, um, that's a question I've never thought about. What, what do you do? What is your position? I mean, I, I can say what I would love somebody to do for me, um, and that would be to sift through the research, you know, to, to say, here was, here, was, here was this article that was in the New York Times, you know, last week that I think will, you know, really get you thinking about X, Y, or Z, or here's a study that was just published in um, the, the reading journal published by the International Reading Association that I think has, has real implications for what you do with kids around reading. I, I would just love to have somebody who was my eyes and ears uh, out there while I was, you know, putting my nose to the grindstone, working with kids. Beautiful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advertise for that position. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of a very busy week and coming all the way down to engage with the Teach for All community. We're really, really appreciative. I'm, so. I've been delighted to be here. This is, this is a privilege, um, you know, and... Um, you know, best wishes with your important, important work. Um, again, it's, um, I, I, th I think it's the best job in the world, and I, I'd like to keep it that way. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.